uh, hello from uh, our program, Freely and Critically, um, conducted by me, Thomas Kowalowskis, and Professor Gendotas Mazekis. Today, uh, our special uh, guest is uh, uh, Per Stam uh, from Sweden. Uh, he's a senior uh, research and senior lecturer uh, in, uh, in uh, literature. Today, our topic is uh, uh, Swedish-Finnish-Lithuanian uh, uh, writer uh, Henry Parland, who lived uh, in Kaunas uh, very briefly during the interwar. Uh, however, his uh, literature heritage is very rich, and we would like to talk about him with the expert, especially now that we have the special occasion. Kaunas is European cultural capital, and Henry Parland uh, is uh, our uh, literature heritage. So uh, maybe the first question for you, uh, per, uh, um, what is the legacy of Henry Parland uh, in, in, in Sweden and in Finland? Is he equally valued, uh, remembered in Sweden and in Finland, or does he have a, a different legacy in these two countries? Uh, since he, he, he was Finland-Swedish, so his legacy is, is more well known in Finland. Uh, most Finland-Swedish people have at least heard of him or, and talked about him and sometimes read him. So, so he's much more well known in Finland. Uh, but He's a, those who really like poetry and literature know about him in Sweden as well. Uh, there is one poem that is often quoted, and it is a very famous po poem, but sometimes people think it's written by someone totally different. <laughs> uh, so the poem is more uh, well known in Swedish. Sweden than in <laughs> than the writer, but uh, since the 80s there have been a little bit of a revival since his novel was published, uh, and during the last five years uh, we have published his collected works in Finland and in Sweden. So maybe Gintotas, you would like to? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, actually, uh, that's uh, uh, when Thomas say that it's uh, Lithuanian as well, it's more or less a uh, joke that uh, it, he's not uh, very no, well known in uh, Lithuania, but in any way he's very important because he described this uh, cafe, restaurants, you know, environment, in, uh, not only in Helsinki, but as well in Kaunas of this time and uh, the feeling of city and this uh, structure of his novel to pieces uh, as well presupposed knowledge of two cities Kaunas of this time and Helsinki as were pubs uh, first of all but uh, in many cases and uh, many literary critiques okay but maybe first of all because uh, only few probably our listeners uh, know about uh, the, the novel to pieces you know could you a little bit to tell us uh, uh, about what and why this novel is important mm. yeah it is uh, it's important because it's an early modernist novel uh, it was written for uh, competition uh, inter-scandinavian competition for the best novel in 1931 uh, and it was written in Kaunas, but uh, the plot is that the writer who has the same name as the author is sitting down to write a novel and to tell the true story about a girl he knew. But it becomes a story about an earlier life and a story about Helsinki. But the frame is situated in a small country, small foreign country, which is, of course, Lithuania and Kaunas. So the telling of the story is, is from Kaunas, although Kaunas is never mentioned. Uh, it's only mentioned as a small foreign uh, town. Yeah, but uh, you know that uh, many of critics uh, write that, uh, and you as well mentioned, uh, that uh, this novel to pieces 
um, have some uh, relationships, at least uh, uh, pr at least some um, uh, vision about uh, Marcel Proust the, the, uh, the, in the search of lost time, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, this is about story as well as well about uh, in some way uh, about memory, remembering. But from the other side, you mentioned about modernism, and there is uh, the problem, but uh, it's not, uh, I'm not quite sure that we could uh, characterize Marcel Proust as a modernist. Uh, we ordinarily consider him a little bit uh, differently, and when we are talking about modernism, could you explain what do you mean by modernism here? Ah, the modernism of the novel doesn't really have connections with Marcel Proust, <laughs> primarily. It's it's the way it's written, and Arlan uses his usual technique from the uh, poems to make things alive, to animate small things uh, and the environment. And as you say, it's a, 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 a book about memory, but also the modernist part is that you can't trust your memories. When you tell the story or the, the author, the writer in the novel, when he tells the story, he, he suddenly figures out that it doesn't tell the truth. You can't tell a true story. Uh, so it's more that part of it that makes it a modernist novel. But it also, it's about Photography. Photography is like a, a, a metaphor for for the map, how the memory works. Yeah, the, the, the novel starts from his uh, uh, the author or a protagonist uh, vision uh, to the mirror, and some of critiques as well uh, related uh, with some reflection of the bricked mirror or the, this. Uh, the two pieces means as well some kind of breaking. So there is uh, two uh, major metaphors, mirror and photography. Uh, but from the other side, we see some technical description, you know, these chemical processes mm -hmm. of a uh, photo. And uh, for some readers, uh, probably it's not quite clear how is important this uh, uh, technical description, this some kind of photo alchemy, I call it, mm. you know, that's some photo alchemic uh, approach. Uh, and uh, many of the photographers say it as well that he used the language of uh, this photo chemistry uh, very old. He doesn't take modernist uh, language or chemical processes. He used much more older, you know, that's could you a little bit comment about this one aside? Uh, what does mean this photography in the novel mm. and how it works as a literary work? Mm. For once, I think the description is, I think it describes what solutions and that he has developers that he has, he knew about. So they might have been old, they might be the ones that his father used, but it's uh, a thorough description, but it is also a metaphor for memory. So it is, it's both. Uh, and I tried to follow the instructions and they seem to be okay. <laughs> I have also been in, in, in a photographer's lab but not with those old stuff, but this was 1929, so. Uh, uh. And, and how this one modernistic and uh, as well as uh, technical uh, anima animation of technical and uh, some animation of some things, you know, uh, how it's related with the uh, formalism as well, uh, because, you know, uh, 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 and some of critiques mentioned, and uh, probably and you, 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 you know better than we, that some of critiques try to connect him with a surrealism, which is not, uh, I'm not sure that is the uh, right way of uh, his interpretation. 
uh, but uh, or even with the Dadaism, uh, which I'm not sure as well. But in, in any way, uh, please, because we're talking on this language, modernism, you know, formalism, what does it mean formalism here? Mm, it, I think the animated objects are, are more connected to futurism. And I don't think there's any real connection to surrealism. Uh, when Parlam was introduced in a Lithuanian magazine in 1929, they called him surrealist. But I have not really <laughs> heard it many, many more times. Yeah, I accept your this uh, position about futurism, and, and if you will check uh, the, his uh, friends, uh, at least in Lithuania of this time, many of them was uh, wonder uh, from uh, avant-gardism and uh, uh, futurism, but not about uh, surrealism, which is was not uh, popular, and even probably nobody knows and nobody knew in Lithuania this. Uh, 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 29, 30 about uh, surrealism, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in any way, a uh, little bit more, please see uh, about uh, the for formalism. You, for yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. Victor Sklovsky yeah. and so on, because it's related with uh, uh, Sesame as well. Yeah, in some ways, yeah. Uh, we know from his notes that he read Victor Sklovsky. Uh, in Kaunas, probably in late summer 1929, because we have the notes. And it seems, it's quite sure that the thing he read was a short uh, pamphlet called Literature and Cinematography. Uh -huh. uh, the notes uh, seem to tell that story. And he was inspired and wrote some articles in Swedish. And the, the Shklovsky Ostranenje. Uh, Ostranenje. Yeah. How do you say it in, in English? You say estrangement or. Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, this is uh, the two concepts alienation. It's not estrangement. Uh, it's uh, different because you know that's. Uh, no, yeah, it's not it's alienation. No, no, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's estrangement or defamiliarization. So yeah, yeah. this distinction, automatization and uh, defamiliarization, he describes that in his articles quite good, and he draws the line to Sklovsky. And in the novel, this the travel from uh, automatization to defamiliarization uh, is what drags the story forward. So uh, when he looks in his mirror, he says, oh, you have to the mirror must have some new things to see, otherwise it would get bored, automated. So, and also the the story about Ami, his girlfriend, uh, is quite interesting until he gets to know her more and his preconceived conceptions about her are 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 false. So that. Uh, What's it called? That yeah, I, I think this atstranenia uh, uh, or defamiliarization, yeah. which you uh, translate, it's very important to explain this uh, novel because, and this is difference I see from uh, Marcel Proust, uh, who, who is not very involved in this breaking of, uh, of knowledge, or uh, it means that defamiliarization always is not just formal, uh, way, but as well, I would say there is some uh, existential elements that you know and know a uh, guy, and uh, one moment you feel that you don't know him at all. Mm. And this, uh, you know, uh, the losing of uh, relationships or the, this, uh, you know, so, so some kind of drama of 
uh, deformularization. I think that's it's uh, important. Do you think? Do you see differences between uh, uh, not similarities but differences between Marcel Proust and uh, 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 Henry uh, Parland? Yeah, there are there are lots of differences. Uh, one of them is that the the memory comes to Marcel in, in, in Proust's novel, uh, the involuntary memory. Suddenly something happens, but yeah. Parland or the the Henry in the novel, he, he, he develops the photo just to get that thing. And then he thinks about a, a gray hat to remember his, his uh, uh, doppelganger. So, so he, he tries to reach his memory, uh, which is a, a big difference. And yes, they work quite in different ways, but they both. Right. Do, do, yeah. do, do you think that uh, um, it's quite uh, astonishing uh, how much education uh, and uh, awareness in the world of literature, um, understanding and feeling of avant-garde uh, movement uh, uh, Henry Parlin had, considering his such young age? Uh, that doesn't it take you as a surprise? Usually at that age we have uh, uh, people just after high school uh, being bachelor students in the university trying to understand what is going on in the world of literature. And here this guy comes, uh, has quite uh, awareness, uh, feels uh, all the streams, all the fashions, do you think it's because of the influence of uh, Professor Vasily Sesaman, or do you think that it's uh, somehow he's just uh, a natural genius? Uh, in, in some ways you could call him a genius, of course, but he was interested in, in, in new literature and new art, and that was uh, in Helsinki as well. So he and his Finland-Swedish colleagues Gunnar and Björling, he, he read the Querschnitt, the German magazine, uh, they read uh, Dadaism and so on. And But I think it is a mistake to make Henry Parlin a philosopher. I mean, he, he read Shklovsky and something clicked in him. He, he understood this, he had read Mayakovsky and so on, and this way of thinking uh, attracted him. But but it, it, I think his brother used to say that uh, Parland had like a, a, a mathematician or a, a, a natural philosopher. He had this uh, structural thinking which made him uh, he could understand things and he could write about them quite quickly. So so, but you shouldn't overestimate his knowledge of, of Russian formalists, for example, but just to, to in a few weeks <laughs> read and understand, it's, it's uh, not, not bad. Yeah, and but also, just... yeah, also uh, Proust, just... we don't know how much he read. <laughs> Maybe it was the first part or something. Uh, and yeah. The, the most, the, the same important is his uh, pr uh, communication with uh, Vasily Sesaman because uh, uh, I think that uh, it's not, it was not so easy to understand Viktor Shklovsky and because uh, Sesaman was involved more in the understanding of uh, Russian formalist and was in some uh, uh, friendship with Zhermunsky as well. So uh, he could explain probably some moments because, for example, we discussed with you about this odstranenia or defamiliarization as some technique. Uh, in any way, uh, on my opinion, as uh, as a teacher, you know, you first of all you need to interpret to understand with somebody. Because I am sure that between Lithuanians, who, which he this to uh, between uh, Lithuanians. Uh, that he knew in this time and communicate with them. A very rare hear about, you know, this uh, Russian formalism and influences. And we don't see in Lithuania literature in this time, the people or writers uh, more or less 
inspired by Russian formalism. So he was very alone mm. in, in this, very alone. And it's very difficult to understand how he could understand without proper education, you know, just to take uh, uh, an article, you know, or books, you know, to read them, you know, to interpret for, for ourselves and immediately to start to use this method for the writing of novel. This is so, something unbelievable, you know, that mm. should be. Mm. But yeah, of course, Sersman was important, I think. He probably l borrowed the book from Sesman. That, that's what I think. Uh, but the strange thing is that if you look at the biography, uh, during the summer, uh, Sesman was away and Parna lived at his house or his apartment. Uh -huh. Sesman was away in Paris and, and also in Russia, uh -huh. in the Soviet Union. For, for traveling and, and meeting his family and so on. So during this crucial time, he wasn't there. Uh, so he, they could have talked about it and so on, read this and so on, but the, the, the working on, on the pieces, uh, but I mean, we also know that Sesman wasn't the only guy, the only man or, or, or the only one scholar in, in, in Lithuania. So he had this friend Vera Sotnikova, but also a, a young uh, man called Dima Markovic. And, and during the work on, on the collected works of, of Parland uh, in, in his uh, archive, there are some texts in Russian, which are not written by Parland. And one of those texts we have been able to see that his friend Dima Markovic, we, we have a few letters from him, has written it. So this even younger person who, who was interested in, 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 in Soviet film has not instructed, but at least communicated with Parland about uh -huh. Russian art. So it makes it more interesting and, and harder to, 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 to focus how, how, how it all appeared. You, you mentioned uh, uh, Vera Sotnikova, uh, mm. his, his girlfriend. And uh, she was uh, an expert uh, on uh, Jewish uh, theater in Kaunas. Uh, so uh, uh, it's uh, funny to remember that uh, Parlan wrote a review about uh, some performances in Kaunas drama theater, uh, Ju Ju Jewish uh, um, drama theater, or was it Jewish Russian? Because Vera Sotnikov was Jewish Russian. So. Uh, and he wrote a review uh, for Helsinki uh, magazine, or was it just a newspaper? It was for uh, Hustas Blood, yeah, the, the daily paper, yeah. Uh, uh, saying that uh, in Kolnas, theater is much more advanced, much more modern than Finnish theater. And uh, I understood that it is um, uh, thanks to Vera Sotnikova that he uh, became a regular visitor of theater. And uh, she uh, also instructed him uh, uh, about uh, the new tendencies in theater. Uh, so that, that's one part of my question uh, regarding theater. Another part uh, of this question is Vera Sotnikova as such, as a person. Uh, because uh, uh, if uh, I'm correctly, uh, if I correctly understood, she was also a romantic girlfriend of him. But when he died uh, unexpectedly uh, uh, because of illness, uh, she became a fiance and uh, later married Lithuanian poet uh, Radauskas. And uh, they spent the uh, honeymoon in Paris, and then they, after this, uh, or before the World War II, or during it, moved to the United States, to Washington, D.C. 
and uh, she looked much older than she really was in, in life. And Radowskas looked uh, younger than uh, he was in his real age. So uh, in Washington, they uh, in Lithuanian American community, they uh, appeared as um, as an older woman, as an aunt with uh, her nephew, uh, uh, whereas they were husband and wife. Uh, so, uh, so two questions in one: uh, the role of Vera Sotnikova for theater uh, understanding in Konas, mm -hmm. and uh, she as uh, Henry Parland's uh, romantic uh, girlfriend, if if she was his romantic girlfriend. Mm. It's a big question. Let's start with the theater. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's in Parlan's letter. She he introduces her as dance instructor at this Jewish theater. And if you search uh, Wikipedia about the Hebrew theatrical studio in Kaunas, you can find a picture from 1927. And in the middle of the picture, Vera Sotnikova is situated. So. She had some role in that theater, that's for sure. And and, uh, and she was like five years older than Parland. Uh, and uh, you, you have seen pictures of them uh, and so on, yeah. Uh, and I think Henrika Zagrauskas was like seven years younger than her. It's not much, but if, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, and through Sesemann, he became acquainted with uh, Sotnikova. And all the sources can tell that, uh, at least that she seemed to be in love with Parland. And that's the story. I have also read it in, in articles about her life with the Radauskas. Uh, so, so, uh, but, and, and in, we have parts of, of Parlan's uh, diary or personal notes, uh, which tells about their, their, their liaison. So, but it seems that sometimes they were together, sometimes they were not. Uh, and the strange thing is when he told about her for, to his parents, he, he never mentioned this. But she wrote to them after he died and said that they were engaged. So they must have had different views on the relationship. Uh, young people, things happen. It's not, it can become complicated. So, and from his letters, we can also see that he fell in love with another girl. So it was complicated. But anyway, they stayed in touch and, and, and so on for quite a long time. I don't know really much about her background. Um, maybe you can tell more. Uh, but uh, I imagine that uh, Parland and the Sotnikov, they had a very rich bohemian lifestyle. Uh, yeah, theater, yeah. literature, uh, and on Parland's part, it seems like there was some heavy uh, drinking. Uh, I don't know if it's a myth or is it a true story that supposedly uh, Parland uh, uh, was sent to Konas by his parents in order uh, to move him away from uh, alcohol environment in Helsinki. Supposedly, a very proper, orderly Professor Vasily Sesaman uh, should uh, m take care of that problem, but uh, it did not happen. Uh, Parland uh, found a very rich Bohemian uh, atmosphere, and I think he was spending time in Metropolis uh, restaurant on the main uh, pedestrian uh, street in Kaunas. Uh, so, so this uh, richness uh, in, in politics, um, Václav Havel, I think, was that kind of person who uh, knew how to make compatible being a president, a dissident, former dissident, and uh, uh, appreciate uh, rock music. Um, and he, it seems like Henry Parland was uh, 
uh, also Kona's iconic person. Too, too bad that he lived too shortly. Otherwise, I think you, we would have a statue for him here. Mm. Mm. <laughs> what is your impression as a researcher uh, on that picture that I just described? Yeah, um, for sure he, he drank too much. That was one of the reasons what the, the, the parents wanted to get him out of Helsinki. Uh, the drinking and the bohemian lifestyle, uh, and he was supposed to, to study law, but he, he didn't, a and he also borrowed money, and since he was underage, the, the not very rich family were supposed to be the ones who paid if he couldn't pay. So, stop, you, we must do something, uh, and they sent him away. They didn't know for how long, and they didn't know it would, if it would work. But the, I think the main idea was get him away from Helsinki. And since uh, I, I haven't gotten to know two of Arlon's brothers, Oscar and Herman, and both talk very warm about uh, C.S. Mann, and especially Herman, uh, because he was some kind of yeah, an uncle that took care of them and talked with them like they were adults, even when they were burnt and so on. So uh, it must have been, it must have looked like a good idea. Uh, let's send him to, 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 to Kaunas and see what happens. It, can't, it couldn't be worse, <laughs> they just thought. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I'm not sure about Thomas' uh, question, you know, that Bohemian not always are related and Parlan case as well with uh, alcoholic drinking. Uh, and if we will pay attention about his essay and novels, it's more no about uh, cafe culture than about restaurants or, uh, you know, and cafe counters in this time is uh, some public spaces and the love uh, of his and all these images in public uh, spaces of cafe presuppose some sort, you know, as well of uh, a literal uh, opinion. What, what does mean, in, in any way, what does mean this bohemian style of life? Because, you know, that's okay, there is some such kind of stereotype that, you know, it's uh, 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 some, uh, you know, uh, drinking, but it's uh, not, not not always. It's a little bit uh, larger, I would say, concept uh, about uh, his form of life because, uh, in other way, he was not. Uh, he will be. He will be not so uh, productive as a writer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, that's uh, probably it was more pose. I would say sometimes in poetry, maybe than that uh, reality. Bohemian life, yes, I agree about it. What's your comment about Bohemian life? What does it mean? It? Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter what we call it, but we, we know that he drank sometimes too much, but that's not uh, or out of the ordinary. But in a letter to a friend, he says uh, that he's an alcoholic. And that's much, very much to say when you're 20. Uh, so, the drinking got out of hand. I but mean, maybe he, drank, he, drank, he drank himself. Yeah, but but that such things happen. But he was a hard-working author. I mean, he didn't drink all all day, all night, and and he had this work ethic, which made him write very much. And in Kaunas, he also worked half time at the Swedish consulate. Uh, so. Uh, on Potvinska Street. He had to work. <laughs> on Potvinska Street, number 64. Okay, yeah. Mm. It's uh, very now, interesting that we are sitting with Thomas uh, now in Potvinska Street as well. But on the number is 23, and the parliament was uh, number 64. <laughs> okay, yeah. The other side of the street was further away, yeah? Yeah, the, that building where parliament worked now is also um the devil's museum okay i understand okay mm. it's a world famous uh, devil's museum um it uh, gets uh, lots of tourist buses however it is uh, not interactive it's a very static museum it has three floors 
with uh, all kind of folklore, uh, Lithuanian big and small dells. Yes. It's just but, folklore museum and nothing, re uh, re no relations with satanism or satanic movement, <laughs> you know. Even there is no relations with uh, gen you, uh, go gothic, uh, you know, a subculture or someone. It's fro so uh, people who would like to see satanistic uh, some uh, museum, no, it, it, they will be disappointed, it's just folklore. Okay. Okay. But, uh, uh, oh, but statues of, of devils and so on. But on that building uh, in 2007, uh, there was uh, an opening of a plague uh, to Henry Parland. Yeah. Uh, till, I, till I 2007, seen... there was no plague, uh, it was incognito. And since 2007, uh, we have uh, this official plague. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I unfortunately I did not attend that opening, but I heard that uh, Henry Parland's brother attended. Yeah, I think uh, Herman uh, traveled. Yeah, yeah. and uh, um, I I uh, looked at Wikipedia and uh, I did not find his uh, date of death. Uh, is is he miraculously still alive? <laughs> uh, no, Herman died the. <sighs> Before the pandemic, uh, in maybe 2019 or or 20 no 2019 yeah. So just a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. He he was born in 1917. So, uh, so and so I, I I visited him uh, a few times the the last years in Helsinki. He was um, uh, at. at a home for elder people and his hearing wasn't very good but but uh, yeah we, we talked about stuff <laughs> uh, he, he usually he was very interested in history he usually starts started his stories way back <laughs> uh, and he also got the first part of, of Parlan's collective works, the, the thick, the thick book with the poems, and and I have a picture where he sits and uh, reads it, which oh, is fine. Oh, show, show it to us if you could find it. Could you find that picture? Uh, probably, yeah. You could open and show it to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I am. I have to open the internet. <laughs> oh, it's not in the book. No, 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 because he, he has, the book is printed when he has it in his hands. I see. Mm. Uh, 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 Parlant uh, wrote uh, one of the title of his uh, papers was The Revolt of Things, uh, and you wrote about uh, it, uh, the, the papers, some kind of uh, manifest of him, and later you discussed this revolt of things with, with some uh, 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 jazz uh, you know, activity or jazz music and uh, you know that's a uh, relationship between an that's uh, uh, you know uh, and, uh, and uh, then uh, about uh, I would say uh, object animation uh, and uh, jazz is not quite clear uh, uh, what, what is the role of jazz uh, of, uh, in his uh, literature, in his novels, uh, uh, essay and uh, poetry? Because many of uh, critics, as you as well, mentioned this jazz element. But jazz in this time, it, it, it's only uh, uh, nine, the end of the uh, 20s, the end of 20s. What kind of jazz it could be? Mm. Uh, I, re I read about uh, the jazz in, in Helsinki at that time. It came through mostly German or, or mid-European orchestras, so they, it had a cabaret <laughs> uh, touch, uh, and in, in German they call it Lärm jazz. They, they hit things and, and, and played very fast. But the story about jazz in, in Helsinki, in some of the years at the end of the 20s, there was a boat with some American jazz musicians who taught Finnish jazz musicians to 
to play more of a real jazz, but it's hard to really. I have found some recordings of, of Helsinki jazz music from the end of the 20s, and, and I mean, it's fast music, and, and I think for him, uh, in, in that The Revolt of Things, which he wrote several years before he went to Kaunas, it's from 1926 or 27, uh, but he, he says something like, You should get give the things your attention because they are alive, alive as we, or even more alive. And then he ends it all with something about a tie, which is the saxophone in, in the jazz band of life. Uh, so the saxophone also looks like a, a tie. So so there are that connection. But he also started to write an essay about jazz or an article that was never finished. And, and nowadays you could say that it's, although, oh, he writes about jazz in 1927, but I mean, it, it's, it's uh, the music of the natives or, or the black people and, and it's, uh, some kind of natural uh, primitive music, which is was one way of describing jazz in that time, but it doesn't really say something unique. And he, he didn't finish the article, it, it ends uh, suddenly and, and we don't, it was never printed until in the 1960s. But he was interested in jazz and he, he was supposed to be a, a good dancer as well. There's dancing in, in, in two pieces as well. And the How to behave on the dance floor. Yeah. Mm. Dance is a very important uh, element as well. It's uh, strange, I'm not sure that uh, he read uh, Andrei Bieli, uh, that uh, Russian writer who always uh, wrote before him uh, about dancing uh, as some uh, essential existential element. and. Uh, many of contemporary researchers in Russia, like, for example, Valery Podoroga, who analyzed uh, Russian formalism, they try to use these elements for the explanation of the topic of dancing in uh, Bieli uh, novels. And it's interesting that uh, uh, Parland as well is very attentive, I would say, uh, to the dancing and this choreography and that's uh, women, uh, you know, legs and this description from the one side. Uh, and uh, uh, could you comment uh, this uh, dancing element in his, uh, 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 in his uh, literature, in his novel at least, you know? Uh, because, you know, I, I would say it's not so simple to describe or to write about dancing, uh, you know, as some some element. Do you have some uh, interpretation of this topic? Mm. No, I think it's one example of his tendency to give, not instructions, but an analysis of what happens on the dance floor, how should you, and also the hier hierarchy, who, who is everyone looking at, who has control over this room, uh, the structure of it all. I think that's what, in, what is interesting for him. Uh, he also wrote an article about fashion, men's and women's fashion in 1920, at the end of the 1920s. Uh, how, how does it change and so on? And why does it change? But that he started from uh, a German philosopher, I think, uh, but, but took it a few steps further. So it's sad that he couldn't 
continue to develop. I mean, you read a few books and wrote his articles and then it, it ended. And the novel was never sent to that uh, competition. It had been quite interesting what what would have been the answer <laughs> from, from uh, the jury? We don't know. Uh, talking about his novel, uh, 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 I don't know how you pronounce in Swedish, Sonder? Sonder. 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 The breaking away into pieces. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, it's and, and, and the Lithuanian, is it the same word? Suduzo means, uh, yes, uh, it's when you drop a glass, mm -hmm. it, it breaks into pieces. Mm -hmm. So th that's what it means. The mm -hmm. result, uh, the result of, you know, uh, of this breaking. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems uh, the same, almost the same meaning. Almost the same, very similar. Yeah. So, but my question would be for you, uh, what, what is actually the original language of uh, Sondern? Because um, uh, the origi originally Parlan wrote in Swedish with his Finnish Swedish language uh, using fin Finlandisms. Uh, and uh, the publisher, the, uh, the editor of the publisher, uh, believe that uh, this language is not proper for Swedish literature language. Therefore, he whimsically um, uh, edited his, uh, his language, uh, got rid of Finlandisms, then uh, even changed the names of some characters, changed the structure of the book. And if uh, I'm correct, it is you who restored the original Swedish Finnish language. You brought back only the, the Finlanders, though. So, is it correct that the second publication is the original and the first publication is uh, almost a fake? <laughs> no, no, not really. Um, it's more complicated than that, but uh, I, oh, we can't, I can't show it. But anyway, it's digitalized all the manuscripts, so you, you can watch it yourself. But he wrote very tidy, Henry Parland, very tidy in, in Finland Swedish, which is, it, it's Swedish, but some expressions are, and, and are, are, are a bit different. And the ones who usually read his things before publication, the poet Gunnar Björling, one of the most avant-garde poets in, in, in Finland Swedish history, was the one who took away the Finlandisms. So, and Gunnar Björling had a very special handwriting and he used a pencil instead of, of ink. So, you can follow Gunnar Björling's... <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, he writes like that. <laughs> uh, so, you can follow and, and you can say, okay, this edition and this, uh, uh, this uh, editing out is by Björling. Uh, but so, so and Björling did this just to protect or, or help Parland, although Parland was dead. And Björling and his friend Rabenke, they read the, the novel when Parland was alive. So some of these changes can have been made. Well, because Parland was back in Helsinki for Easter 1930 and much of the novel was written. And then they must have sent the, the, the manuscript back to Parland. And, he wrote a little bit more. And we have Björling's letters about the novel uh, also. Uh, anyway, Björling and Rabbi Enkel were those who edited the novel. And to save or, or protect some people <laughs> in the novel, they changed the names. So Gunnar in the novel, who, who looks very much like Gunnar Björling, uh, became Josta, <laughs> and Ami became Ami with a, a Y. I can't remember. I I I haven't figured out why. Uh, and and so on. Some other friends uh, they changed the names also, uh, and they took away some portions of, of the text. Uh, and in the six, 1960s, 
Henry's brother Oscar edited his novel and he, he brought back the names but he also tried to what did Henry want to do and there's a, a like a map of, of the novel with the, uh, the, the chapters and Parland Henry had had some thoughts about the structure he also started to uh, write uh, a bridge to, to put a part of, of the novel into the beginning of the novel. Uh, and, and his brother Oscar thought, okay, what will happen if we do what he started to do? So he, he uh, because you know the structure first, you have the story until Ami is dead and then the narrator starts again because now she's dead, what, what can he say? So he starts in another, from another angle. But some of the criticism of, of, of from the friends who read the novel, they said that yeah, but it's strange that you don't take it in a chronological way. So it started to, but, but it, it can't be done because it, it gets mixed up because it's also told in the third person and then in the first person. And if you mix those parts, you have to change very much. So anyway, Oscar did that and, and it became a novel with three parts. So when I started my dissertation, or before I started my dissertation in, in the 90s, I, I, I read the different, there were three editions. And I, I couldn't figure out how it all started. How did it end this way? <laughs> um, and then I, I contacted Oscar, who had this manuscript at this place. So my idea was to just uh, publish the manuscript text, but also I had to edit some things, um, what, what, words that were written wrong and, and uh, sentences that didn't really work out. But then I used the first edition from 1932, which solution had they, or at least I thought, I looked at the different solutions. So yeah, I, I restored the novel. And the funny thing, thing is that all the people had working on this novel were Finland Swedish, but I'm Swedish. So a Swedish guy came and, and restored the Finland Swedish and, and the colloquials and, 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 and so on. Mm. And when we worked now and the collected works of Parland, uh, we understood that some things that I changed when I, uh, because Parlan writes, for example, underfunden instead of underfund. Also, ah, I realized that word. He, 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 he consequently writes it the wrong way. And now when we worked at the, with the collective work, we said, ah, let's keep it, although it's wrong. But I wasn't that, liberal <laughs> i was very liberal but not that liberal but now we were <laughs> more liberal with, with the language and the fun thing was that people finland swedish people and also swedish people they thought that was uh, one part of the nice thing about the novel because it might be the language of 1929 in helsinki if you had a Russian background, but, but still, because they had these words that high literature shouldn't have and uh, and so on. So, so it, yeah, rest, restoration is, is the right word. So it seems like um, uh, reading it uh, in Lithuanian or in um, English, we lose uh, uh, a very important part of uh, of that book, which is uh, the language, uh, the specific language, because uh, we look only for the content um, and for the ideas, uh, but uh, but it has an entire dimension from what I understood his his language. Uh, it's, it's, it's a flavor that it's hard to to to. 
to keep in, in a translation. But the English translator, Dina Cannell, he was very fond of, of Harlan's quirky language, as he, she called it. And she, she really tried to find a way to, to at least keep some of the quirkiness in the English translation. Uh, that was one of her goals with the translation. Not just the story, but also something of, of the language. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, such an interesting story. It seems like uh, we could write uh, a separate book about your work restoring. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a de detective uh, detective story to restore um, the original literature of, pa of Paron's novel. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like uh, to remind our viewers that we just talked uh, about uh, a Finnish Swedish uh, uh, writer Henry Parlin with uh, Swedish uh, uh, senior lecturer uh, Per Stam and uh, editor of uh, Parlin's uh, novel Sonder to Pieces. Uh, this is uh, our program uh, freely and critically uh, conducted by me, Thomas Kowalowskis and Professor Gintotas Majekis.